Okay, I think it's uh, time to make to make a start. My clock here in uh, Kuala Lumpur it's uh, uh, at 2200, so that means it's four o'clock in Amsterdam, three o'clock in London, and uh, ten o'clock in uh, in Washington. Thanks very much for joining and for registering and joining for for this session. This is the third uh, peer exchange that the B Groups Foundation. Um, organizes, and this time in partnership with the, with the Knowledge Gateway. We'll hear about that uh, uh, from, our, from our presenter. And it's very encouraging to see uh, such an interest in, uh, in this session, and that so many of you that register are actually um, sitting in, in the room. Um, my name is Pier Andrea Pirani. Even if you see me in the, under the participant list, uh, with the name uh, user compart, um, this is the, uh, the account we are using for for this system. Um, I'm Italian. I I work for uh, a small consultancy company which is called Euphoric Services. We collaborate with the D Groups Foundation among other things. Um, we support the D Groups Foundation with the communication and members relation and indeed uh, with the design and facilitation of this uh, uh, peer exchange session. This is what we're going to do today. Uh, we'll spend just a couple of minutes uh, uh, to learn about D-groups for the one of you that are not familiar with D-groups. And then we'll look into two case studies. The first uh, will be uh, the Implementing Best Practice Knowledge Gateway. It will be presented by Angela Nesh Mercado from the Johns Hopkins University Center for Communication Programs and k for health Knowledge for Health. But after the first case study, we'll, uh, we'll take uh, uh, 10 minutes for first uh, Q&A session. Uh, um, we'll then move uh, into the second case study, which will be presented by Neil Pakeman Walsh, and we'll look at the uh, IFA 20, 2015, Health Information for All by 2015. After that, we'll have a second Q&A session and uh, about half an hour for, indeed, Q&A and, and open discussion. And we'll look, in particular, at how, what are good practices for effective use of female and uh, online forums for healthcare professionals. Um, but since we are so many in, uh, in the room, uh, before we start, uh, uh, let me just share with you some uh, ground rules, or indeed how we're going to facilitate this session and use, and use the platform. Uh, you may be familiar with AT&T Connect, which is the platform that, that we are using, or indeed with, uh, with other uh, similar um, online conferencing platforms. Uh, um, let me just run quickly through some of the features and how we're going to how we're going to use them uh, in, uh, in this session. Um, first of all, I would like to ask you to keep your microphone muted. You see the button here? I'm pointing to it. Uh, if we keep our microphone muted, that will reduce uh, uh, background noise and we'll get a better audio quality. So please keep your microphone muted. We'll give you the floor. Uh, we'll encourage you, we encourage you to uh, take the floor and to ask questions or comments in the Q&As, uh, in the Q&A session. So we'll g give you the floor then, but unless you're speaking, please keep your microphone muted. Then I'll do the same, I'll do the same myself. Um, we have uh, a few options to communicate in a nonverbal form, and uh, I would encourage you to use them. You will see here I'm pointing to uh, the emoticons. So if you've got uh, uh, questions uh, during the Q&A, I will ask you to raise your hand, as I'm doing now. Or if you have problems in understanding, you can show it us through the Cantier emoticon. So I would encourage you to use this to facilitate uh, and have a more effective conversation, to facilitate the discussion and have a more effective conversation. Um, We'll also be making use of the chat. You will see we have the option to send notes, and that's here in the, I'm pointing to it, or you can see all the notes next to the participant tab on the uh, right-hand side of your screen. Um, we encourage you to use the notes to 
ask questions during the presentation, or better, to record questions as the presentation unfolds, or indeed uh, if you don't have a, a voice connection. Some of you are using the, uh, the, the, micro, the, the dial in connection, uh, so, sorry, the web application, so you won't have option to, to speak, uh, possibility to speak. In this case, please use, use the notes. Um, we're also recording this event, uh, um, so to be able to produce a video uh, to, to share it after uh, with the wider community and the people that couldn't attend this meeting. So the meeting is recorded and uh, uh, we'll produce a few, uh, we'll produce a, a short videos of it uh, in, in the coming days. I'll, I'll talk about that uh, uh, at the end of, of, the, of, of the meeting. Um, I'm not alone in uh, uh, facilitating the meeting. Um, Christine uh, Kalsus from FAO will be uh, helping in the facilitation through the chat monitoring. So she will pick up the question that will come through the chat. And my colleague Martin Boers will support us with the technical facilitation. So if you have any problems with the uh, program, you don't, you don't hear the voice, or you have any problem in seeing the presentation that are shared, please send a private note to Martin. You can do it by choosing the send note option and choose Martin uh, as a recipient. Um, like I said, all the slides and their materials will be then made available in the following days uh, on, the D -Groups, on the website of the D-Groups Foundation. Before we go into, into the presentation and the case studies, uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, Neil Pakeman Walsh to say a couple of things uh, about DGROUS, because Neil is not only our presenter today, uh, but he's also the chairman of the DGROUS, DGROUPS Foundation. Uh, Neil, over to you uh, to give us a couple of words about DGROUPS for the participants that don't know, know about it. Thanks, Neil. Great. Thank you, Theo, and I hope everyone can hear me okay. I'm speaking from a very hot day in Oxford. And um, just to give you a sh brief introduction to the D Groups Foundation, it was established in 2009, but it has its roots back as D Groups uh, formed by the Bellinet Secretariat or um, uh, facilitated by the Bellinet Secretariat in the early 2000s. That's part, that was under the IDRC, the Canadian Bilateral Agency. We are a group of 18 development organizations, including GIFID, um, the Food and Agricultural Organization, um, the Swiss Development Corporation, and others. And we're all committed to communications for development. I'd like to flag up to everyone here that we are indeed enthusiastic to welcome new members. So we would be very happy to grow from our current number of 18 to 25 or even more. And you can find out more about dgroups at our website, dgroups.info. I'm especially excited about today's meeting because, well, one, it's about health, which is the area that I'm particularly interested in. And, and secondly, that we have um, Angela Nash as a speaker with us today, who is speaking on behalf of the Knowledge Gateway, which um, is worth pointing out is actually using the same underlying software that we use for dgroups. So it will be really interesting to see the different ways in which we're using the software. I'll pass you back over to Pierre. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Neil. And thanks also for um, making my, my job easier to, in, in, in the sense that you have introduced uh, you have already introduced Angela. Angela, the floor is yours, but please let's try to stay within the 15 minutes. Thank you. Will do. OK, thank you, Pierre, and thank you, Neil. I'm really happy today to be part of this peer exchange. Again, I'm Angela Nash Mercado. I'm with Johns Hopkins University Center for Communication Programs and the Knowledge for Health Project. And it's really my pleasure to introduce you to the Implementing Best Practices Knowledge Gateway. 
Implementing Best Practices, or IBP, is an innovative partnership committed to improving reproductive health. And today I will just talk about a um, brief uh, introduction for the IBP consortium in general and then delve into some details on the IBP Knowledge Gateway. And I'll highlight some of our experiences developing and facilitating communities of practice on the Knowledge Gateway. So the Implementing Best Practices Initiative is really dedicated to scaling up what works in family planning and reproductive health. And this is a consortium that has been in existence for 13 years now. slides here. So we're really supported by a diverse range of partners from donors like the USAID and international organizations like WHO and UNFPA. Uh, we possess a really broad spectrum of skills in the field of research and program management and technical support to countries. And again, our goal is really to network with networks at the global, regional, country levels to reduce duplication of efforts and harmonize approaches, really maximize the use of resources to ensure that best practices are identified and scale up to improve access to quality reproductive health care, in particular family planning services, maternal and neonatal health, adolescent reproductive health, integrated STI HIV prevention care and treatment services. So IBP members all have funded country programs and we all have materials and tools and experiences and lessons to share with each other. If we were to work alone, we would just be uh, individual islands of excellence. But working together, we're part of a more powerful force, a community of practice with resources that are capable of achieving greater economies of scale. So these are some of the, uh, the founding partners and new members who are part of the consortium. So you can see it's really broad, broad reach. And we know from our experience working in countries and from literature reviews that we and others have undertaken that our biggest challenge really is not in producing new knowledge, but rather in finding ways to more effectively transfer and exchange and apply knowledge with the goal of changing and improving practices for family planning and reproductive health. So we're really working to overcome the knowledge to practice gap. So that was our, our, our challenge. And our solution, or communities of practice, created around particular family planning and reproductive health technical areas and why using this approach of communities of practice. I think uh, those in the presentation today know some of the benefits. Uh, really, members can learn from what others are doing, you can share information, insight, advice, jointly <coughs> create tools, uh, promote collaboration in general, share lessons, save time and, and money doing so, and really cross boundaries of distance and organization, different hierarchies and time. So we needed a platform for our community practice work. And the WHO Department of Reproductive Health and Research in collaboration with J2CCP, my organization, and other IBP partners researched, designed, and launched the IBP Knowledge Gateway back in September 2004. And this is a very simple tool that uses web-based technology to function through emails to support establishing knowledge networks or communities of practice. And it's designed to work in technically challenged countries or areas of low bandwidth so folks can share and exchange and transfer, discuss, and access knowledge. And again, it's very simple to use. The Gateway is one part of a comprehensive knowledge management strategy that was developed by IBP partners to share technologies and processes and information. And in addition to leveraging funding, 
WHO does a lot more. It supports us through JHCCP and others, the management of the gateway. Each year we support a program of work enhancements that are available to all organizations that are managing their own customized, branded, owned communities of practice on the Knowledge Gateway. We also support a number of global discussion forums on a variety of, of topics. Also, WHO has brokered, taught, and facilitated um, at least six independently managed communities, including D groups. So again, we support other organizations and agencies to establish and launch and manage their own customized branded communities. And what you see here are the online spaces, uh, which is an important part of the, the knowledge gateway. But it's also very important that users can access everything via email. And again, it's useful in settings where individuals have sporadic access to the web, but easy access to email. So what we're really doing is providing the guidance and tools on how best to use the Knowledge Gateway for communities of practice. So this following slide here has some of the current statistics for the Knowledge Gateway. Nearly 43,000 members from more than 200 countries with hundreds of communities of practice, all on different topics relating to our work and beyond. And from our experience, uh, these are some of the design principles we like to follow. Um, and keep in mind when developing and moderating your own community of practice. So as your community is evolving, so does the structure. And you may need to change or update your structure depending on what the community is used for. Open dialogue between internal and external perspectives are critical. And you need to find a way to link the community to outside sites or experts or other communities. It's important to recognize and accept different levels of participation. Most community of practice members never openly participate, but you know they are they are seeing your messages. It's also critical to develop both public and private community spaces where you can encourage people to communicate one on one as well as through a larger group. And really in the beginning, focus on, on your value, both to your individual and members and an organization it is another important piece of design. And you can combine routine events with um, new exciting milestone events or discussion forums. And in general, try to maintain a rhythm for the community. So really, part of that is having somebody who is a community leader. And so once you have your core group of dedicated members, you want to identify potential members who can help keep others engaged. So just like a teacher in a classroom would plan activities to keep students engaged, your, your COP leader must think about different activities to keep the members engaged and enthusiastic about the community. So you can send surveys out or email-based questionnaires periodically to find out what members are interested in what topics they want to discuss or focus on or resources they want to share. So engaging and maintaining a COP requires similar considerations when developing any kind of community. You need to stay focused on your, your goals and objectives and keep information current. And your members will be more likely to refer to the communities and others and will continue to participate as things evolve. So again, your community leader, um, supports that relationship and trust building. They seed and feed discussions. Um, they direct knowledge nuggets to people. And they, they work to network within the community. And they also do some you know, cleanup activities as well. And these are some additional strategies here for fostering engagement. And I want to point out that the online discussions are a great way to engage people, and this can be done strictly via email, as can all these other, other pieces as well, you know, creating e-newsletters that are going out via email. Again, these are some of our, our findings on what makes a successful community of practice, um, attractive purpose and goals, grabs and maintains attention. Also knowing the value and benefits. You know, I'm more apt to join a community where I know I'm going to learn and be able to share knowledge. And 
we've found that blending face to face with online activities whenever possible is a, a big, big win. But again, you need that, um, that skilled leader and facilitator, very critical role. And the important thing to remember is that this can be done via email. Uh, and I want to leave you with some of these criteria for success that we've outlined after our many years of experience facilitating our own communities and helping others on the Knowledge Gateway. And what we have on the Gateway are access to different um, tools and resources for community leaders. So we offer people step-by-step step what's needed to create your community from creating goals and activities and communicating with your members, building your audience. Um, and you can go to the Knowledge Gateway, uh, knowledge-gateway.org, or visit the IBP website at ibpinitiative.org, and you can find out uh, more information and, and explore and see if there are any communities you're interested in. So thank you. Very good. Thanks for this excellent presentation. Uh, I see that some people are already asking to if this will be available for downloads. So. And we'll uh, make, uh, as I put in the chat, we'll make all the material, the presentations available tomorrow. The recordings will follow next week. Uh, I would okay. now like to open the floor for the first uh, uh, Q&A. So um, yes, I see already one hand raised. Uh, so please follow the example of Damilola. I hope I'm pronouncing it correct. If you would like to ask a question to Angela or, com or, or give a comment or share uh, your experience, please raise your hand uh, like uh, Damilola is doing and I'll give uh, uh, so we, we can manage the conversation. Uh, Damilola, the floor is yours, please. Damilola? We, I'm not sure we can hear you. So while we sort uh, the audio, the middle, uh, um, maybe you can uh, send uh, your question as, as a chat message using the notes function, so we can, uh, um, we can still get your, your point. Uh, I see another hand raised. Neil, please. No, thanks, Peter, and uh, thanks for a really great, um, uh, concise presentation, Angela. Um, the question I had that came to my mind just now is, is um, how do you work in terms of governance? So you talk about an IBP um, consortium. Is this, a, is this a sort of loose network of partners, or is it a, has it set, it set itself up as a legal entity in some way? And how do you, how do you therefore manage and 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 uh, steer your strategic directions as a group? Well, the IBP initiative has a secretariat housed within WHO in Geneva, and they're really responsible for setting up the annual program of work and helping to Hello. coordinate. Can you hear me? Okay. They have yes, to coordinate. Right. They help to coordinate amongst all the, the different IBP partners. Can you hear me? Sorry, wait. Sorry, there is a bit of, uh, I'm not sure we're talking at the moment. Uh, Loma, probably. Uh, let's, let's hear from Angela first, uh, and then if you would like to have the floor, please raise your hands using the emoticon. I'm pointing here where you can find the, the emoticon to raise your hand. Sorry, Angela, please go ahead. Okay, no problem. Again, so IBP has a secretariat based at WHO in Geneva, and they really are responsible for pulling together a program work, a uh, program of work for each year, and they coordinate with all the different IBP partners, including the donors, USAID. Uh, we work closely with them, and we have a lot of activities in our individual work plans, different project work plans. Um, so we will jointly create um, documents, resources, publications, or we may have a conference or another activity may, may occur. Um, I think Neil had asked about governments as well. 
there is some country work going on, and you could visit the IBP website to find out more about that. I don't have all the details on that, but I know they have some activities happening in Zambia, I believe, and a few other other places. So it is, you know, a bit loose, but it's also a lot of coordination happening amongst all the different partners, really, with the goal of not duplicating efforts um, and really sharing what we've learned and. Another uh, key resource related is um, a toolkit on scaling up and you know facilitating change, and that is another resource that's really really new for the IBP and a good one to explore. Thank you, Angela. Question? Thanks very much. Um, I don't see any hand raised, uh, but please, if you have any question for Angela on the presentation. Neil is happy about your reply. You can see is uh, showing a thumb up. Um, <laughs> um, any other question for Angela in terms of uh, the, the initiative and how they are using the technology to uh, achieve their needs? And again, I would invite everyone to, to go into the Gateway and explore if you're interested in any health topics. You can see all the different communities, and some communities are small, just a handful of people, other are thousands or bigger, um, and really they're all doing different scopes of work, but um, the Gateway is the platform that we all use to, to facilitate our conversations. Thank you, Angela. Uh, in fact, I, I have a question for you, um, or let's as, as I said that, a couple of questions ca came in from the chat. So uh, Tony has some problem with the audio, but he's, he left uh, um, a question in the chat. So a specific issue, which eventually can change the overall flow of the conversation? How do you manage the COPs to meet uh, both the needs and, uh, of the few and the many? Mm -hmm. So more about well, managing. Thanks, Tony, for asking. Yeah, that's, that's a good question, Tony, and you're right. Um, and I can speak to some of my experiences with different communities that I've either been a leader on or a member of. Um, and what we really do is look to those community leaders to, to help guide the discussions. Um, I mean, some communities are very small and we're set up just around you know, creating a specific event, and others are very large and their whole purpose is exchanging knowledge on a particular topic like mobile health. There's a really active community. Um, and it's up really to the community leaders and, and members as well. You know, survey your members and find out do people want just a open exchange with messages coming in without a lot of um, you know critique happening or do they want things to be to be very um, tight and edited down. So it's really something to determine you know, as you're setting up your community and to look at periodically as it, it grows and, and consider if you want to change your setup. But you know, every community is is very different. So and there's another question about how do we reach a new audience or get our network known about? And again, within the individual communities of practice, um, for example, one I was involved with many years ago, we started out with a face-to-face -face meeting of about 20 people, and then we went online to the Gateway, started having discussions, created some documents. We always uh, reached out to networks of different projects we knew or different associations we knew of, um, did a lot of promotion and had promotional plans um, and strategies for reaching uh, new audiences. Um, one example is we did an online discussion forum before a large conference, so we were able to dialogue with the uh, people who participated in the conference before, during, and after, um, and that was a good way to kind of bring in new members and um, also do that face-to-face -face component for that one. Were there any other Thank questions you, Angela. for me? Please, if you have any question, raise your hand or, or indeed leave a, a, a note uh, like uh, uh, Tony and uh, uh, Nicola just, just did. Um, in the meantime, while we wait, if 
participants have any more comments or questions on your presentation, I have one specific um, point that I would like to, to ask you. And this ca came, came out uh, quite often in previous peer exchange we have organized with DGROS, which has to do with uh, capacity building and how to get, uh, uh, let's say, the optimal use of the platform. Right, so, uh, and this is not only for facilitators or group administrators, if you want, but also for, for participants. So, uh, because a lot of uh, different administrators in, in D groups have, are facing this challenge that users themselves don't uh, always make the best possible use of the platform. So, my question is, have you encountered similar problems, and if so, how do you go about capacity building of both users and, if you want, administrators or community leaders? Mm -hmm. uh, one, one thing that has worked in uh, a few communities or having a few key individuals within the community that you can always count on that they're going to share information and recruit others and really be kind of your, your star um, members. Uh, but but it, it is a, cha a challenge, and I do have a slide I didn't include here that has, um, I can share it with you, uh, different um, symptoms, you know, that you might be experiencing within your community and different uh, ways to deal with them, like if you're not having a lot of, of dialogue and you might want to send out a survey, finding out, you know, what people are really interested in, in talking about, um, or maybe send a survey out about, you know, or people receiving too many emails from you or not enough or, um, you know, are they happy with the scope, et cetera. So just finding ways to engage. We've also um, offered, you know, like prizes of sort to, to different folks uh, for completing the survey. Maybe it's a publication. I mean, it's very exciting, but, <laughs> you know, a family planning handbook or something will do that. And then, again, I think a really key piece is uh, recognizing contributions. So. People see the value, you know, it's as simple as, you know, letting people know I received your contribution, I'm going to post it, or I didn't post it today, but I'm posting it tomorrow, if, if you're moderating heavily. So again, you know, that acknowledgement can go a long way. Thank you very much. That's, that's really useful uh, and interesting to hear. Um, any other questions for, for Angela uh, about her presentation or the Knowledge Gateway? in general. If you have, please um, raise your hand or indeed leave a note using the chat function. Okay, I don't see any hand raised, but we can go uh, back to, to Angela if we have any more questions in the, in the second part of the Q&A. Thanks very much, Angela. Uh, I'm sending you um, a virtual clapping. You see I'm using the emoticon to to clap, thanks very much for your presentation. Uh, I'm now passing over to... I'm leaving my email address as, in here as well, so if anyone has questions, you can email me. Okay, uh, I think before we go to Neil, I see Martin. Thanks very much, Angela, for your contact details. We'll include that in the communications after the event when we'll share the, the materials. I see... Martin, okay, no, it's, it's clapping, uh, it's not hand raised. Um, so let's, uh, let's now pass on over to the second presentation, uh, and we'll hear from uh, Neil about the uh, um, IFA 2015, um, healthcare information for all. Neil, I've just gave you presenter rights, so you should be able to pull indeed. <coughs> Perfect. Thanks. So the floor is yours. 15 minutes for you as well. Thank you. And again, like before, well, while the presentation unfolds, if you have any question, please record those or comments. Record those using the notes, and we'll pick them up uh, at the end of the presentation. Thanks, Neil. The floor is yours. Great. Many thanks, Peter. Um, I'll be talking about HIPAA 2015 and how we use D groups. So as Pierre explained earlier, in addition to being chair of the D-Groups Foundation, we also use D-Groups as a, an affiliate, and I'll explain that in a moment, on the D-Groups Foundation. Uh, here you'll see our website 
hipaa2015.org and the um, email uh, platform which is dgroups.org forward slash hipaa2015. Um, so we've got the, the, the way it's set up is that uh, you have separate web, we have a separate website for explaining everything that we do and a, a website web page that is part of the dgroups page for the communications. Now, the outline doesn't look as quite as complicated as it, it, as it appears. It's just 15 slides that I've got here. I'll be looking at why we chose dgroups, how we add value to the discussions, how we use the discussions, and then I'll finish with a question for all of us to discuss, which is basically how can we, as in all health and development forums, collaborate with each other better. First, I want to say why we chose dgroups as our platform. Well, we wanted to use email and dgroups focuses on the email experience. Email is more, it's, it's more inclusive, it's more accessible. Um, anything, that is, anything that requires web-based interface is bound to exclude people um, by necessity. We also want to be able to add value to every message and dgroups has a unique functionality which allows us to do this and I'll show you that too. And by the way, everything that I'm saying in this presentation would apply to the Knowledge Gateway because the Knowledge Gateway uses the same software. We also chose dgroups because we wanted to collaborate with other organisations and the dgroups foundation has 18 development partners including DFID and many others. And we want personal high quality technical support in a non-commercial environment. And again, I'll say hats, hats off to Damir Sinanik and WA Research for providing excellent technical support. Now I mentioned about affiliation. We, HIFA, are actually affiliated with INASC, which is one of the main DGROUPS partners. There are 18 partners, each of whom pay 4,000 euros per year. Um, but organizations that have less than 500,000 euros annual turnover can affiliate with the full partners to allow them to have a group. So what do we want to achieve with HIPAA 2015? The rationale is laid out in a Lancet article by Fiona Godley, myself and others. But our vision is a world where every health worker and every citizen has access to the information they need when they need it to prevent and manage disease and injury. So HIPAA is a community of purpose. It's not only a community of practice, it, but it is what I would describe as a community of purpose, which is that the members, when they first came together, defined their common vision, uh, which we published as a foundation document, and we're all working together towards that vision. Now this is the strategy for achieving our vision. I'm not going to go through it in detail um, because you can see it on the web and it's described in detail on the web about how this all fits together. But, there, but I just wanted to show you this to show that there is a logic to what we're doing as part of a broader strategy. So you see the HIFA forums on the bottom left there. Um, the HIFA forums and in other words, the dgroups, our, our work on dgroups is only part of a much broader strategy, but it is the central and most important part. And so I'm, I'm putting this slide mainly to flag up to potential um, new projects, to think about not just having a forum that hangs in, in midair, so to speak, but to embed it in your organization's strategy. We launched in, the, in Kenya in 2006 at the Association for Health Information and Libraries in Africa Congress and we've grown to around 6,300 members since then. Next year we're coming back to Ahila, uh, this time to Tanzania, to review progress. As I mentioned, there's 6,300 members from over 2,000 organisations. Roughly half of our members are health professionals and the other half are a mix of information professionals, publishers, policy makers and researchers and others. 
One of the nice things that the dgroup software does is produce these maps for each dgroup. And this is the global map for the HIFA, 20, HIFA 2015 dgroup. So you can see that we've got a lot of members in the UK, um, America, also in Nigeria, India, Kenya, Uganda, South Africa, and sm slightly smaller numbers elsewhere. But, but we've got a good spread in 170 countries. This is the kind of spread that you might expect for an English-speaking list, which is what HIFA is. So how do we add value to these discussions? I actually wrote a, an article for the Knowledge Management for Development Journal about our approach that we've built up over many years. And we call it reader-focused moderation. And one of the aspects of reader-focused moderation is that we add, add value to every single message. Now, the dgroups software that we use, thanks to WA Research, allows us uniquely to do just this. It allows us, if necessary, to edit the subject line, to edit the from line, and to edit the body. Now, by editing the subject line, we can make sure that the line that is at the top of the message, which is what people will see first when they first go into their email inbox, actually reflects the content of the uh, message and it also it bears the number on, um, in the thread. The from line we're also able to edit. This allows us to change what might be a, a non-intelligible from line which has come from the uh, sender's email client to include the actual name and country where they're sending the message from. And the body of the the particular thing that we add as part of our reader focus moderation is a signature profile to the end of every message. So every single member who has who joins HIFA 2015 um, has a signature profile which is added to the end of any message that they may send. And that's actually done manually, but it only takes a few seconds to do. How do we use the discussions after they have been, after they've happened. Well, in our experience, discussions have often not been used. Once they, once they tend to be ephemeral in, in many forums. Um, some, I know that some communities of practice have tried to, and, w and we have ourselves, tried to do summaries of threads and things like that. But in effect, that doesn't have a long shelf life in terms of interest to people. So what we've devised with help from WHO Library is a new approach which we call HIFA Voices, whereby we select short verbatim extracts from HIFA messages and then tag word, tag word those and add those to a searchable database. We already have a prototype functional knowledge base. It's not yet public, but it has 560 HIFA Voices in it. And we know that within the archive there are several thousand more which are waiting to be processed. Now we're designing this so that the database will drill upwards, so to speak, to major databases such as the IntraHealth International Human Resources for Health Global Resource Center, and downwards, so to speak, to the full text of the source message and the discussion thread from where it comes. And we can use these HIPAA voices for many different purposes. One example is given here that we used HIFA voices, just a small number in the prototype that we had, to inform the development of a new WHO guideline on optimizing health worker roles to improve access to key maternal and newborn health interventions. And we have a, um, an acknowledgement here from Simon Lewin, who is on the WHO guideline development group, just to say how much potential the, this um, approach could have. And how do we engage non-English speakers? Well, this is critically important, uh, given that English is spoken only by about, I don't know, 20% perhaps of the, of the world or less. Um, so we now have five different dgroups in three different languages, which we run in collaboration with WHO and others. Um, we found that attempting to have two or three languages on, on a single forum doesn't really work well. 
And so we've ha- what we have are parallel forums with bilingual moderators, which helps with cross-fertilization. We're funded by a number of organizations. Our main funder is the British Medical Association, which has awarded us 10,000 pounds, that's about 12 or 13,000 euros uh, this year, and has been doing so for six, year, six years uh, consecutively. And we also receive smaller amounts of money from all the other organizations that you see here. And the total that we income that we have for the HIFA forums is 25,000 euros per year, which is only enough to, to fund one full-time staff, myself. And I find that this is actually more, more than a full-time job with respect to develop, in order to roll out the whole strategy that I showed you earlier, we really need at least one, full, one new full-time staff or full-time staff equivalent. And I would like to flag up that we get a lot of help from lots of volunteers among the HIFA members. So there's HIFA country representatives, there are the people who are in, on the HIFA steering group and the various uh, HIFA working groups. How do, we, how do we evaluate what we do? Well, I won't go into this, but just to flag up that there are, that we've discovered through a major external evaluation in 2011, that there are two ways of looking at this. One is the formative evaluation, and the other is the impact evaluation. And we've learned what we did in 2011 with a very, very substantial grant of $50,000 from the Rockefeller Foundation, which is actually a lot more than our um, annual uh, turnover, operational turnover, which was spent on external evaluators. Uh, but they, they were nevertheless only really able to do a formative evaluation as opposed to an impact evaluation. The impact evaluation of knowledge networks is notoriously um, difficult. There's a web address there for details of the evaluation and the evaluation report. So I'll finish with a question for discussion for all of us. As I mentioned, how can we all work effectively with one another, as in all the many forums in global health? It seems to me that we're all doing our own thing, and more and more global health forums are popping up like mushrooms. Uh, but we are not, not, in my view, talking to each other as much as we could be. I really believe that we could um, do much more together than we can separately, which is one good reason why I, I'm so glad to see Angela um, and the joint meeting today. Uh, thank, special thanks to, um, well, to everyone and to INASP for being our affiliate partner, D Group's partners and board here for doing a great job with communication support, Damir Simonik and WA Research for excellent work with the platform and all HIFA members and volunteers. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil, uh, for this excellent presentation. Um, we've got a few questions and comments uh, that uh, were recorded in the chat during your presentation. Um, I would like to start with Tony. Uh, you, Tony, you had a comment uh, about around the community of purpose. Um, element that Neil raised. Would you like to elaborate more on that, also in relation to the question you had before for Angela? Tony? Yes, please. The floor is yours. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, the uh, question really, I, I think, um, what you had mentioned on community of purpose hit a uh, comment that we had with Angela, which is how do you um, keep the community on target or on focus? Uh, and I think community of purpose is one way to go in the sense that everybody is moving towards a common objective or some sort of common objective. Well, my question, I guess, is that one can have a community of purpose in the sense that we're all health professionals or that we're all working in Guatemala on agriculture or whatever it is, but given a specific issue, how do you then focus in on that so that with, since you could conceivably talk about a whole range of issues, 
how do you provide focus and, if you will, purpose within a specific thread of discussion? Thank you very much for the question. Tony, uh, can I ask you, sorry, I forgot to mention before, uh, can you please introduce quickly yourself, where, where are you calling from and uh, your affiliation? Sorry, I'm calling from the uh, United States and Maryland, and uh, it is extraordinarily hot today here. Um, but I'm with USAID and Policy Bureau, but I've also been working in office management for a lot of years. Thank you very much. Uh, Neil, would you like to reply to Tony's uh, question? Yes, 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 sure. Uh, three things. One is that a community of purpose, by our definition, is, is is um, is not only a community that has a shared interest. A community of purpose is a community that actually has a time-bound goal. And this is the uh, I'd be very interested to hear about other communities of practice that have time-bound goals that are that have been discussed and elaborated and defined by their members at the beginning of the group's existence. This is what happened with HIFA 2015. Um, so that's why we're called HIFA 2015. It's, it's, um, we, 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 def we, d we defined in detail what we meant by health information for all and what we meant by health information for all by 2015. As it, ha as it happens, we are not going to achieve that goal in, in every sense of the word by 2015. That's evident. Uh, but what, we, what we've done now, um, I digress slightly, but it's, it's, I think it's of interest. What we've done now is that we've Remove, we're going to remove the 2015 we're with, with the with discussion of with the members. We have removed or will remove the 2015. So that now becomes a hitter non-time bound vision, which is exciting actually for all of us because it opens up the prospect that we can slip in individual hitter smart goals that are defined by the members. So strategic, measurable, achievable, relevant, time bound goals. The first time bound goal we have already <coughs> defined, which is um, M -hif M -hifer. Um and I won't go into that, that yet. But coming back to the, the, the about keeping things on target, first of all, I think that the moderator always has a fine line to to take between um, not being too rigid on the one hand, but not letting things slip too much too much outside on the other. And I think that that's something that moderators uh, learn with experience. You don't want to be too rigid. It is interesting sometimes to divert for one or two messages into a related subject. Uh, but, it's, but it is less interesting to allow diversion for 10 or 20 messages into another subject. And so you need to keep a, have, have a use judgment for that. We also do have guidelines that are sent out to mem all new members when they first join explaining about what is appropriate and what isn't appropriate to, to send. So uh, those, those can always be referred. Whenever we come go back to a member uh, uh, with regards to a, a message that is going off topic uh, and if we think that it is um, better to change it in some way, then we'll refer back to those guidelines. And I think that it's useful to have such guidelines. But in general, we found that um, we found that uh, it's 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 worked so far among all the forums that we've had. We don't get many complaints about uh, going off topic, um, and we also deal always on a one-to-one -one basis with the with authors of messages that are off topic. I'll, I'll pass over. Thanks very much, Neil. Um, I, uh, Tony is indeed asking via the chat if you can, if you could share the guidelines for uh, the facilitator. Um, can that public can be can made available to a large Yes, indeed. Very good. So we'll, we'll include, uh, I don't know if they're already uh, uh, somewhere on the web, but they, if, if there is an hyperlink, we can include this into the materials uh, when we share the materials with the participant after, after the event. Thanks, Tony. Thanks very much for, for uh, asking. I, I would say, yes, in, response, in response to what Tony said, 
Uh, perhaps I would need a little bit more time to explain, but no, communities of purpose are community-oriented. In other words, the, the, the groups that, for example, we have an MHIFA group, but that MHIFA group is not actually implementing, it's leading the advocacy work on behalf of the community. Um, perhaps I, I, I probably need a bit longer to explain how it, how it works, but the important thing is that the HIFA Secretariat provides communications and facilitations and advocacy. Um, but what, what, HIF, what the HIFA Secretariat is not going to start getting into, so to speak, is actual implementation of health information delivery projects. Because as you can understand, those, that implementation work is done by our individual members autonomously and independently. So we're not trying to create any kind of new health information delivery mechanism. It's much more like a, a vast think tank, if you like, of health information users and health information providers talking to each other about how they can do their jobs better. Thanks for the clarification, Neil. Um, w one comment regarding communication skill, one side comments and mo sorry, moderation skills. Uh, indeed, Digro is uh, working or will soon be working with some of the current partners to provide, that's the idea, to provide some short modules on, about online communication, a type of uh, uh, synchronous and asynchronous um, events whereby we would uh, help uh, in building the capacity of moderators in online groups and communities for the groups, but we hope we can open that up for, uh, for others. That's still a uh, work in progress uh, and we'll be happy to share more when uh, uh, things are, are more defined. Uh, thanks very much for your comments or question, uh, Tony, and uh, also uh, there's some background noise. Rajinder, thanks for your comments about how to improve the uh, meetings. We'll, uh, we'll take notes of this. Uh, uh, and uh, we'll try to do a better job, better job next time. Um, Tony, if you don't have any more questions, I would ask you to unraise your hand because your hand is still raised. Uh, or indeed, if you have more questions or you would like to take the floor again, keep your hand raised. Uh, in the meantime, I see Angela has uh, a question. Angela, over to you. Uh, does is the signature profile, I think that's really a positive thing to connect people on a personal level to get to know a little bit more about each other. So I wanted to mention that uh, because I think, you know, we are getting more and more social in our interactions and, you know, knowing more, knowing the profiles, even photos of people, it's all um, very good information to have. Neil? Uh, yes, I think that uh, Angela's was a comment, but not a question. I can say a bit more about signature profiles. I mean, for example, with, um, with signature profiles, what happens is that a member, uh, a new member, would contact us through our website to to uh, join the HIFA 2015 forum, and the form on our website asks them to put in their name, country, pre uh, brief description of professional interests email and so on. And then we fashion a, a signature profile based on that, based on the information that they've given us, given us and sends that back to them. Um, occasionally they'll come back and say, well, I would like it to read slightly differently, which is obviously fine. Um, it's, all, it's all done, it's all a bit clunk, clunky in terms of technology because the, the, uh, the current platform doesn't allow for automation of profiles and so on. And I think that ours is the, possibly the only group of, of forums that adds these uh, HIFA profiles or signature profiles onto the end of messages. I've not seen it in, on other lists at all. Of course, on other lists you can click, up, if you're online, um, which many of our members will not be when they're reading the email messages, but if you are online then you can click on to the person's name and find out whatever information they've put into their online profile. 
Thank you for elaborating, Neil. Um, there is one more question pending from uh, from the chat uh, uh, from uh, uh, Rajinder. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing it correctly. Um, sorry, from Anshi, uh, and is asking what's the what's unique about D groups in comparison to other online groups. Um, Neil, would you like to to answer that? Yes, sure. Well, first of all, Bigroups is a partnership of development organizations. It's non-commercial, so everybody in the Dgroups partnership is all like-minded. We all want, we're all working for a better world. For, we're all working for international development and international health. So that's one aspect. There are no advertisements, etc., etc. The second is that it's email. The, the, the emphasis of the whole development is to give a good email experience for the user and we find that email is the most accessible medium as compared with web-based interfaces for these kinds of discussion forums. And the third thing is, which is unique in, uh, with, the, um, with the D group platform <coughs> is this ability to be able to edit the, the three main fields on any message before those messages are approved, which allows us to add value to those messages in many different ways, which I, which are, I explained briefly in one of the slides of my presentation, but are explained in more detail in uh, the journal article that I wrote in the Knowledge Management for Development Journal. So I think all those three things mean that for us, at any rate, it's, it's, an, it's a no-brainer. Uh, D-groups is definitely D-groups that we would want to be associated with, um, and definitely the D-group platform that can allow us to do what we want to do. Thanks, Neil. Um, we've got one more question in the chat from Nicola. Do you find that people don't want to give you all the information for their profile? Um, I, this might also be for, for Angela and indeed other um, participants that are using online forums where people create profiles. Neil, would you like to reply on that? Yes, that does happen occasionally. Um, and people can join. Uh, with just their first name or with and with almost minimal information about themselves. Um, we've never had in the whole of the experience of, of running forums um, since 2006 and even before I used to run forums since 2000. I've never ever in, in, in my whole um, life as a moderator uh, come across a person who wants to join anonymously. And indeed, I wouldn't... Um, I wouldn't uh, encourage it, if you like. I, I suppose there, there might be a right, I don't know, but I think there's also a right for people who are on the forum to know the other people who are there. Um, I think that it's important that the readers, which is why we call it reader-focused moderation, I think it's important that the readers know who is saying what, um, rather than having things said anonymously or um, uh, hidden in, in whatever way. So we try to encourage uh, transparency, but clearly it's, it's, not, it's not essential that a person gives us uh, all details about where they are and their full na name and so on. But on the whole, 99% of people do want to give their full details. And indeed, sometimes we get <laughs> whole pages of uh, professional interest, you know, they do, they cut and paste their CVs almost, into the um, uh, send box. So we do have, do have to cut that down. Thank you, Neil. Thanks very much. Uh, for you, one it's related from Tony, related to the moderation. So are all the messages moderated? Uh, so that... Yes. And, and the second question, so if you could uh, uh, address one after the other, it's again a clarification on the signature profile. Um, I, I, I would, yes, that, that's, please keep uh, the, the question coming in by a chat or indeed if you would like to take the floor, um, just raise your hand uh, and then we can, we'll, we'll give you the floor so we can have uh, a voice conversation more than a chat-based one. Neil?
That's a good question that Tony's asked. Um, and uh, I think that it's important here that the moderator is completely aware of what their role is. It's really, really, really important that the moderator sees their role as being in service to the, all the members. And to and one-to-one um, -one communications between the moderator and the author of messages is a really important part of the dynamic. So what it's, it's, it becomes clear to members who, are, who send messages regularly that the moderator is not there to control the, the discussion in any shape or form, but is there to help and facilitate the discussion. Now, whenever there is a message that comes in that is off topic, let's say, uh, the worst thing that a moderator can do is ignore it and delete it. That sh uh, in my view, that should almost never be done. Um, if there's a message that is not appropriate because it doesn't meet the guidelines on the, on the, in the um, introductory notes, then it's really important that the moderator goes back to the person who wrote it and negotiates, if you like, with that person to say how they, that message might be made more relevant to the members of the forum. And we do a lot of this with uh, our communications, which means as well that the final messages that end up being distributed on the forum are often um, much more useful and valuable and relevant to the forum than they might have been at their first go. So I think the, the, the key here is, is by always making oneself seen as uh, being in service to the others, to the members, um, which also means that the moderate, another thing that the moderator should not do in my view, very rarely if at all, is to offer their opinions as a comment on somebody else's message. Um, I think that the opinions coming from the moderators should be few and far between in general and should rarely, if ever, be associated with as comments on other people's messages. So it really is a, a fluid and hands-off kind of approach or what, what feels to the members as being a, as a facilitatory hands-off approach. hope that helps. Thanks, Neil. Um, there is also address the clarification on the signature profile, if it is attached manually or automatically. Oh, I see. It's attached manually. Yes, it, when, we, when, we, um, when a message is... Uh, the, the approval process for a message is to go into the D groups inter for a moderator, it's to go into the D groups interface, um, find the message, open it, and then add, and then cut and paste the profile from an offline directory. It it is rather clunky, but it's but the system that we've got at the moment with the D groups platform doesn't allow us to do it any in any other way. Thank you, Neil. So indeed, that goes back to your uh, the point on your slide where where you mentioned that there is a, a lot uh, of facilitation going on, and therefore uh, you need quite some help also from from volunteers. Uh, and that's uh, I think that's great that you managed to have different volunteers that are helping you moderate the different lists uh, and keeping them keeping them going. Um, um, I'm not I would sure say that, I'm, 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 sorry. On, on that point here, right. I would say, hello, here? Yes, please. Yeah, on, on the point that yes. you just raised, the, um, the, I wouldn't want people to get the impression that the forum is being moderated by lots of different moderators. The volunteers that we have, have roles other than moderation roles in general. Um, I find, or we find, that using the process of reader-focused moderation, it generally works best if you have one lead moderator for each forum. 
So we do, we do indeed have a volunteer moderator for the Child 2015 Forum who are trained up in moderation skills. And similarly, we have WHO staff running the HIFA Portuguese and the HIFA Evetnet French Forums. But I, we've, we've found that even when you go on holiday for a couple of weeks and somebody else takes over, it, it, sh it shows how there can often be miscommunications and so it shows, in my view, how it's, it's actually better to have one lead person for each forum rather than to chop and change and have somebody do it on Thursdays and somebody else do it on Sundays. Thanks for your clarification, Neil. Thanks. Very useful. Um, Please keep your uh, keep your question coming, or either via the chat or raise your hand if you would like to or contribute, uh, or indeed ask a question to both Neil and also Angela to her present uh, on her presentation before. Um, there was a comment that I received via chat. Uh, basically, uh, one of the participants is asking to clarifying indeed the distinction between the knowledge gateway and uh, and D groups. So the question is: Is not knowledge gateway? Does the knowledge gateway educate now to start an online platform, while D group is an existing pl platform that you have in, you have to be invited to? Uh, that leads to uh, the question that Neil is posing in his last slides, and we see online. Uh, indeed, knowledge gateway and uh, D groups are similar initiatives. So they provide a platform for. Uh, hosting and facilitating communities, uh, online-based communities. In the groups, uh, IFA 2015 communities, and you've got many different communities uh, from education to agriculture to climate change. Uh, professionals are having online conversation. Well, the Knowledge Gateway is a similar initiative, so the sister initiative, if you want, we only on else. Uh, that brings me to the uh, to uh, if if and Neil and Angela, if you would like to clarify further on my comment, please uh, go ahead. But that brings me to my to the question that Neil has raised: How can different uh, uh, existing initiatives that are similar and strive for the same or similar goals to better collaborate with one another. So how can we uh, encourage the, the, if you want, uh, uh, breaking down silos between different uh, um, existing communities? Any, any suggestion on how to go about this or any comments, any experience from the other participants in the room that you would like to share. I, I suppose that many of you are either participating in online forums or even managing and uh, uh, administering online forums. What would be the best way to uh, collaborate more effectively with one another? Don't be shy. We're all here for learning from a peer exchange indeed, so we had two great presentations, but we learn as much uh, from the presenters as we learn from the participants. So if you have any um, case or any comment that you would like to raise, please uh, go ahead. I see one hand raised. Lizly, please, the floor is yours. Can, can you can please you hear me okay? yourself? Yes. yes, please go ahead. Where if you can start, uh, you my, can just introduce name, yourself. Thank you. Yes, my name is Leslie Ann Long, uh, previously with the Open University in the UK, but now with Empowering Frontline Health Workers in Washington, D.C. I think uh, one of the ways that communities of practice can collaborate across organizations is to have a common cause, initiative, project, or theme. And I think Neil's demonstrated how that's worked very well by having the subgroups within HEFA 2015. And I think if you look across all these different, you know, M Health Alliance, um, K for Health, HEFA, and so on, if there are common areas of interest, then I think people migrate across different communities of practice and bring with them the experience and knowledge that they have from their different communities of practice. 
But I also had a question, and I apologize because I came slightly late to this um, debate, so it may have been covered, is what do we actually mean by how can we work more effectively together? What does working effectively look like? Um, what is it that we're actually aiming to do? Thank you very much, Leslie. Uh, Neil, over to you for, for a reply since you posed the question, and then we, get, we go over mm -hmm. to Angela, uh, which has raised her hand. Thank you, Neil. Well, I, I think Leslie Ann gave a good, 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 uh, good comment there and a good question at the end there, too, to clarify what our question is, because questions are more important than answers, really, and to understand what we meet, what we're trying to, to do. Um, I think that the question itself is open for discussion <laughs> um, in the sense that uh, I think that there is a potential space for uh, administrators and moderators and, and individual members of uh, the various global health discussion forums to sit in the same room uh, virtually or, or in reality um, and actually ask ourselves um, how can we do better together or how can we do better than we are already doing at the moment and then we, it raises questions like are we duplicating one another's work um, are we making it clear to end users what is available um, in terms of uh, what globally is available I mean, for example there is no portal or gateway to my knowledge that uh, lists HIFA 2015, Knowledge Gateway, other health forums, GHD Online is another one. There are many global health forums, but they're currently not, not listed. So one, one way of art framing the question is from the point of view of end users rather than from the point of view of the moderators. In other words, are end users, is it clear to end users what's on offer? Is it easy for them to find the forum that is, going to, that is the right forum for them. Um, at the moment, I think it's really cha chaotic. Um, I also think that there is an area to do with um, collaboration between the different moderators and forums with regards to cross-fertilization and publicizing each other's forums, which I try to do on HIFA 2015. I try to flag up the Knowledge Gateway and the different for forums on the Knowledge Gateway and also uh, other forums. Um, particularly, of course, if, they, if it's a message that is tending to go slightly off the main t focus of HIFA 2015. But I think, and I, I think a third area is the whole, which comes back to what Pierre was saying about uh, capacity building in, and training in facilitation and moderation skills is that this is an area that we could perhaps work on together. And I'm, I'm wondering, in particular, if the Knowledge Gateway and D-Groups could work together on this area, um, especially given that we are both using the same platform. So we would both be having the same challenges and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. And Liz Leanne, if you Otherwise, I'm passing over. Okay, let's let's first uh, close on this, please. Liz Leanne, floor is yours. And I'd be very happy to talk to you offline about how we could look at some collaboration across a number of communities of practice. I'm not sure uh, we hear. I, at least I didn't hear all your comments. Could you please repeat? Yes, of course. Um, I just wanted to thank Neil for a very helpful response and to say that I would be very happy to follow up with him offline on ways in which maybe we can set up some collaborations across a number of communities of practice. That's, that's lovely. Thanks. Well, thank you. I think it's... I, I look forward to that. Yeah, but I, I think it's also worth worth pointing out that IDS, the Institute for Development Studies in the UK, is currently looking at the potential of, um, here, you'll need to help me out, in, at, at, at how, what's it, how is this 
it's some kind of way of connecting different forums, isn't it? Uh, sir, are you coming again? But so this is the Adrian Bannister IDS is currently looking. Uh, it's currently starting to look at po the possibilities for channeling uh, forums into a single space. Um, I yeah, can't yes, remember uh, the Yes, uh, IDS and the Eldest community are doing some work uh, with APIs to connect uh, uh, different existing communities. Adrian is in the room. I know he has audio problems, and here he comes, comes his, uh, uh, his comment. Um, so there's some technical solution they're working on at IDS with Eldest community. IDS, the Institute for Development Studies in uh, uh, Brighton, is the use of APIs to an indexing tool to uh, connect, uh, let's say, data from different uh, communities. Um, Adrian, would be, I know that you've got some some background noise, but if you would like to comment more on comment more on this, that would be great. So basically, it's a technical solution that helps users to see uh, what conversations are happening in different forums who are if you want the person more, uh, I would maybe influential or more uh, active in different communities and uh, helping indeed users to identify where specific conversation around health in this case or around uh, uh, agricultural, agricultural, rural development uh, uh, and other development issues are, are happening. So you can see Adrian's comments. Uh, he has got, uh, uh, he says he's got a, a lot of background noise, so he prefers not to uh, talk over the line, but uh, you can see uh, his comments here. And actually, we will look, uh, the, the idea is to look into these issues, technology solutions to connect uh, uh, existing communities in the, in the next digital exchange planned uh, uh, in, in, in fall, during the fall, in the last quarter of this year. So we hope uh, uh, we can hear more uh, from, from Adrian and others that are working on these solutions uh, in the uh, next uh, event. And you've got uh, here in the chat, you've got uh, um, Adrian's email address if you want to contact offline. Thanks very much, Adrian, for contributing uh, through the chat, even if you I have some audio. audio. I'd like to move on to uh, Angela, who has raised her hand, her hand for a while now. Angela, please, uh, the floor is yours. You brought up the technical solutions with the APIs and searchability. I think that's all critical to explore. And then very basics, you know, cross-promoting and continuing to exchange such as we've done now. And also working on products like monitoring and evaluation, sharing what works. Um, changes are, are really important to have amongst all of us who are managing different spaces. Thank you, Angel. So that's... Uh, uh, that's a good comment. So this, this initiative, like we're doing today, uh, it's already something that can help uh, in uh, uh, sharing and collaborating and, and see what each other are doing to, to create synergies and, and, foster, and foster the world. Um, Neil, you've got your hand raised. Please, over to you. Yes, it's just I saw a, a question from Anshi Zachariah saying, how do you support new groups and organizations to form D groups independently? Is there any relaxation in criteria regarding financial criteria? And to answer that question, we have two, there are two ways in which you can use D groups. If your organization has a turnover of more than 500,000 euros per year, we would invite you to become a full D Groups partner and contribute financially to the running of D Groups, uh, which is 4,000 euros per year. 
If you are an organisation with a turnover of less than 500,000 euros, then you can still um, you can still use D groups without actually paying anything at all, provided that um, you your your uh, aims and objectives are um, you know to do with international development, and provided this is the other thing that you that one of the 18 D groups development part uh, sorry. And provided that one of the D groups partners agrees to be your host, so in effect, um, it's thanks to Inasp that HIFA 2015 is able to use D groups um, because Inasp has a larger turnover than HIFA does, and um, it it is a full partner. Um, I used to work for Inasp, so I had connections there, but. I think, in general, um, non-profit organisations in the South, for example, uh, should not find it too difficult to find an affiliate partner if they want to, provided that they are small organisations um, uh, looking to just run one D group. Thank you. Many, th many thanks for the clarification, Neil. Uh, there is uh, one very interesting question in the chat for Tony Pryor from Tony Pryor, and it relates to impact. Uh, so uh, it's it's to to both of you, I suppose, but also to the other in the room. So indeed, impact is not just uh, uh, related to the number of people that talk. So how do you track impact, and how do you demonstrate impact back? To your donors and funders. That's uh, uh, that's a critical question in all uh, communities and practices and online uh, forums and initiatives. So, uh, could uh, either uh, Neil or an, an Angela or indeed any of the participants um, share how do you how do you track impact of this type of initiative? How do you demonstrate I it? I think uh, what we're doing right now. Is a lot of looking at the reach, um, you know, the number of, of users, how we're reaching out. But the use of the information, you need to dig a little deeper, and that's something we're working on now to try to set indicators for that. But it's, it can be a challenge, um, and definitely it's something we're, we're working on now. Thank you, Angela. Uh, Neil? Please. Yes, thanks. I don't, I don't understand this word lurker at all. It's not in my vocabulary. <laughs> um, it's, I, I, I see everyone as a reader, um, and well, everyone is a reader. Well, except for the people who, who, who delete the messages, which we don't have to worry too much about anyway. Um, but basically, there, there is, there is no such thing as a, a lurker, in my view. Everyone reads, hopefully, the messages that grab their attention through the subject line. And in our experience, about 15% of the readers um, also contribute messages occasionally. Um, I think that uh, the, 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 the areas of evaluation and impact evaluation in particular are a um, they may be a related area, but they are a big um, separate area in some, in, in some respects. Uh, we've done a lot of work on evaluation, um, and I, I can go into more on evaluation if you'd like me to, but in general, what we've found is that true impact evaluation, i.e. impact on health outcomes, is very difficult, if not impossible. We had $50,000 spent by external evaluators to evaluate HIFA 2015, and uh, the impact in that respect was uh, the, the evaluation needed to be formative. Perif peripheral, peripheral listeners, yes. I, I, yes, I, indeed, that's... Uh... I, I'm, I'm, another point is I'm very glad that 85% of members prefer simply to read most of the time. I see all of them as being potential contributors at some point in the future. So I feel I see them as part of the dynamic, not as, not as separate from the dynamic of the discussion. 
but I see them as part of the dynamic, uh, an important part of the dynamic, and that's why we call our approach reader-focused moderation. The focus is on um, adding value for the readers, um, sometimes known as the lurkers. Thank you very much, Neil. And indeed, this is a, a, um, a, a very big question that maybe we can uh, uh, address in a future in a future peer exchange. So to look specifically at how to uh, different ways to uh, uh, to identify and track impact of communities of practice and online networks uh, uh, and initiative. Um, it's now uh, we're now one minute over time. Uh, so unless uh, there is any burning question, I would like uh, to stop here to, to close here the meeting. Um, please join me in uh, uh, sending a virtual applause to our presenter and indeed to all of you that have participated uh, in the question. So you see I'm clapping using the emoticon. Um, Uh, upload the presentation tomorrow morning, uh, so you will receive an email with the links to the presentations. We'll make, make available. Uh, uh, one week uh, or so, you will be informed when the recordings are online. Um, like I said, the for, the, the the next peer exchange is going to be probably in uh, around November, and indeed we hope to look into technology issues uh, and uh, how to create more linkages between uh, uh, existing existing initiatives in a more automated way through APIs and other technical solutions. Again, thanks very much to all of you that have participated. Uh, thanks to our presenters. And I look forward to see you online in the next event. Thanks very much again.